Hello everyone. Thanks so much for joining this webinar. It's called Beginner's Guide to Multi-Agents. And this is a webinar with our guest speaker, who is also a regular speaker at our webinars, uh, Dr. Tom. So we're very happy to have you here. And thanks everyone for joining. My name is Yukti Tivedi, and I will be your moderator for today. And one of my main jobs here at Single Store is to organize weekly AI webinars. We organize maybe two or three webinars per week and demonstrate in different data and AI use cases, new tools and technologies. And we also post about our upcoming webinars here and now. So if any of these topics are interesting to you, feel free to connect with me on LinkedIn or follow Single Store. And I'll also like to hear your feedback or ideas on sessions that you would like to see in future sessions. Um, if there's anything that you are working on right now and you want a webinar on that, feel free to put that in the chat and like we can actually have a discussion and uh, you know maybe we can actually host something uh, based on that. So speaking of future sessions, we have got amazing sessions that are coming up and uh, I will be putting everything in the chat regarding that. So you can uh, RSVP there. So you might have also noticed that we have an auto RSVP feature to our uh, on our website. So if any of the webinars are interesting to you, uh, you can just check box so to auto register, which will add future upcoming rooms to your calendar, which you don't need to join each webinar live. And it's just an option for those who have requested to automatically receive the video recordings and the GitHub links. Just an FYI that we will also have a Q&A session uh, at the, during the end of the session. So if you have any questions, feel free to use the Q&A button, which is present at the bottom of the console uh, to ask any questions that uh, are relevant to Dr. Tom or uh, uh, Akmal over here. So we'll try our best to answer all the questions live. And so moving on, I'm very excited to announce our speaker today. Joining us today is Professor Tom. Uh, he is from University of Colorado and Boulder with extensive experience in uh, 3D printing, big data, and citizen science. He has published more than 30 articles across these interests. So. We're very happy to have you here, Mr. Tom, and very sorry if I missed something. Uh, definitely doesn't make up to it. The introduction doesn't make up. So, uh, yeah, please take it away. Thank you so much. Um. All right. So, I just kind of go ahead. We we have no no introduction presentation today, right? Uh, Akmal, do you want to do a small monologue about single store? Because I have not prepared any uh, okay. introductory Just, thing. Just so when you say take it away, are you talking to me or talking to Akmal? Akmal, Akmal, Akmal. Okay. Yeah. Yeah, I, I can just say a few words. Uh, do you uh, have a presentation with you? Um, I didn't have a, a particular slide deck prepared, but that's okay. I, I, I can say a few words about... Uh, Company. Right. Okay, so Sounds originally right. founded in 2011. So as a company, we've been around for some time now. Here we are in 2024. And so both the company and the product used to be called MemSQL. And so the Mem part was uh, an indication of in-memory processing for online transaction processing, OLTP. Okay, so that's what the specialist kind of area was for the product in the early days. Uh, subsequently, some years along the uh, along the way, then decided to add uh, support for analytics, columnar support. Okay, so for these uh, some min max average count type operations that you want to run at scale, uh, and then obviously it didn't make sense to call yourself MemSQL anymore because now we are doing analytics as well as OLTP, and not only keeping the data in memory but also storing it to disk for sort of long term storage and permanence, and so hence the name Single Store. Um, and so single store, the company now has this unified storage mechanism, okay, a single table type that can deal with both analytical access for OLAP, online analytical processing, and OLTP. Uh, so today, the company uh, is some uh, 100 million plus US dollars in annual recurring revenue, ARR, okay, and over 350 global customers. Uh, usually we show some slides about now and I complain bitterly that we haven't updated them. Today I'm having to do without any slides, so I'm just doing it from memory. Uh, but we will get those slides updated in due course. And so architecturally, I mean, the product at its heart is a relational database engine. And it is capable of uh, uh, multi-model okay, support. So it has support for uh, JSON, for example. Uh, geospatial time series vector support has been in there for some time actually quite a few years so we are not 
a company that has just added vector support. It's already been there for some time, but earlier this year, we did announce some major uh, innovations and improvements to the vector support. So uh, indexing, for example, a dedicated vector type, rather than having to store your vectors as blobs, for example, and uh, um, approximate nearest neighbor search. Uh, so these were sort of uh, very, very useful. We've covered them in uh, some previous webinars as well. And we have integrations with a wide range of other tools and technologies as well, such as Apache Spark, Apache Kafka, for example. Uh, we work on all three main cloud providers in the Western world. It's uh, AWS, uh, Google Cloud, and uh, Microsoft Azure. can use it in a Docker container as well. There is uh, the opportunity to install it on-prem. But uh, with the links that uh, Yukti will share with you, okay, you can register and be up and running in a couple of minutes, okay? So the free account, which I use now extensively, okay? The free shared tier. I was just talking to my colleagues a little bit earlier on uh, the, the growth engineering team, and uh, I was sharing with them my experiences that, you know, previously I, I choose the standard tier, which kind of burns through credits, uh, even though it's not very much, uh, you know, sort of point. 0.25 to 0.28 credits per hour. You can make your credits go a very, very long way. Uh, but the free shared tier is always on. Um, it's pretty awesome. Okay, and with that, I will stop there, okay? Because I think Yukti will probably share some links with you uh, in the chat. And uh, I'll step down now and to assist her with the Q&A, okay? So please keep, keep your questions going and uh, we'll do our best to answer them. Uh, and uh, Tom will talk you through and uh, hopefully there'll be time at the end at the end so if there's some something specific so we'll do our best but we may not know what uh, is specifically on tom's mind you know we'll try and answer the questions to the best of our ability but we'll try and pick some as well that we can't answer perhaps and then leave those to uh, tom to assist um and so over to you now tom thank you very much all right uh beginner's guide to multi-agent welcome back to the webinar series so i started with a webinar on beginner's guide to vector databases. I did not expect it became a series, but it has become a series. I've been enjoying thoroughly doing this, working with uh, Yoxi <coughs> and Agmal, and three of us seem to work together quite well, and we are example of a multi-agent system, which is what I'm gonna talk about today. And, and I am sharing my slides, and these are the blank slides, and they are available on at this link, and you, I encourage you to download them and you could follow along if you want to, if you happen to have a drawing tablet, okay? And so I, what I, um, I'm gonna do is to turn off my camera so I can save bandwidth and then focus on SketchIt. And then uh, on when, at the q and I'll turn my camera back again so I'll be able to see you and you'll be able to see me. All right, so I'll see you soon. And, but you can still hear me. So I'd like to start my webinar today with a real world example based on this uh, product called Orion. It's by Gravity Foundation, which is uh, it's in my city, in my neighborhood. So they have a pretty good team and a very uh, compelling use case. So I use this to motivate multi-agent and to give you a real world perspective. And let me see, is this happening correctly? Okay, wait, yeah, I just, all right. So this is where I want to be. Wait. Okay. And so when you like to build a thinking about, well, should I use a multi-agent system for my use case? You usually start with what you already have. So if you run a business and you have data and you probably would have a database and probably run some something like SQL and with lots of data and they might be using single store or some other vendors. And then you have people who, and then and then on the, the other end, you have business operations who run your procurement department, buying uh, inventories or also marketing department and to buy ads and and buy, work with those influencers to sell your products. When you look at your own team, you might realize on the data side, you have uh, one analyst you also have a manager and that's what you have. And when you think about, maybe I could use AI to enhance my my team and to do to optimize my business process and hopefully turn a profit. And then and you will start with what you already have here and you will say, well, maybe I could still uh, somehow see where the AI could 
play the role of an analyst, you could be able to double the productivity. And you were trying to trying to see whether I can describe the analyst with, say, for instance, uh, I say, oh, well, I can give you a big story. I have a curious analyst, and I also have a manager who is always suspicious of what the analyst might have said. So I can say, oh, I find I think our manager is quite suspicious all the time. So that's what I studied with. And and when you build a multi-agent system and you and such as using Orion, and it, what Orion wants to achieve is that they would like to provide the services will be similar to have a bunch of McKinsey consultants. So McKinsey consultants are very expensive to have to hire. Wait. Why is this doing this? Okay, let me just make sure. Mercedes consultants. Do you like your multi agent system to work like a group of Mercedes consultants, except that instead of work, working eight hours a day, you could have them working 24 hours a day and seven hours a week. And you looked at this while you, how you can fill in a blank. So you will probably think, well, I would like to have uh, someone who could write Looker. Um, model language, this Luca ML, this expert, if you do that, and you'll be able to write Luca ML, which is sits on top of SQL, and they will go to your database, retrieve some data, and then come back with data and generate some reports back. And with these reports, you could hand off to, well, it would be nice to hand off to another expert called Action. And then this expert will be able to recommend things like, oh, well, maybe for the recruitment department, so something actionable, let's buy, buy uh, maybe 300 boxes. Okay. Uh, Uh, so, and then, um, so I apologize that I think the, the writing experience is not really smooth. I have, I experienced a lot of lag. So fortunately today I'm prepared. So I actually have a contingency plan. I have second device. So I'm going to stop share and using another device. Hopefully they'll help would be better. Okay. So I have my backup okay so are we are you seeing uh another set of slides here okay and then so i will be able to do this okay uh and then i would like to do is Wait, that's not exactly what I want. Just give me one second to jump out of this. Okay, so I think what I'm going to do is I'm going to write uh, directly on top of this. And where I was at is that I'm trying to say that we have, we're trying to define different agents we need. We'll have this, oh, this is much better. Can you see my screen? Okay, good. You could. Action. And then you also, the, the, the agent, you, we want to be able to make business advice, like buy 200 boxes to the, to the procurement department. And then, but you would like to be able to justify it. So you realize, we, I need another agent to be able to tell me return on investment. And so along with this suggestion, I can say something like, oh, your revenue, projected revenue is of, up 10K. And for a marketing department, the same agent could be said, Suggest action like buy more TV ads. And then for justification, the ROI agent could be saying like, oh, you're going to increase 50 maybe large clients. And, and that will be in your report and trying to just complete this Luker expert. So this is my another agent. Okay. And then, and then with this, we would like the ideas that like it could have them working 27, 
24 hours and seven days a week with some kind of coordination and hopefully achieve this result. Orion is making promise that you could do that. And so uh, anyway, so the, I want to use a real world example to give you a sense that lots of companies are trying to think about agent and to incorporate that into their uh, business workflow and hopefully with a um, idea to increase their profit and to engage with customers more. Now going back to the actual lesson that I'd like to do today and make it bigger now. So uh, the next section, I, what I'd like to be able to take you, you to go in from beginning. At the time we only started with large language models when, and, and we, if how we could evolve to rack to agent and multi-agent over time. And so let's go back to when we just had the logic model, you're trying to apply this to your own application. And so, and then you will have this user and the user will submit a query. And for instance, user might say, well, how much are two bags? That's how what I write for this query. And then we will send this to logic model. This, I use this to denote my logic model. And you're going to provide some answer. One example of the answer could be, well, you are talking about flower, right? That's my guess, even though it didn't say flower. And a bag of flour is 12, or maybe it's $24. And so how would the language model know how to do this? Because it was trained from the internet worth of data. And on the internet, so there's lots of there's a lot of data and knowledge on the internet, and then also is a bit more a bias toward the global north. So it's, when you talk about a bag of stuff, instead of rice, it's more likely to say flour. So large language model just as is pre-trained, they were going to use the internet to draw its knowledge. But the problem with that is it doesn't really use your data. What happened? You have your own data and for your own local business need. And that wouldn't work quite well for internet. But we still like to use logic model. Why? Because even though it's trained on internet with someone else's data, because of that, a lot of data, it actually does math quite well. This is what we want. Math, we want it to apply its logic. We want it to perform some reasoning. This is what we like the logic model to do, not to hallucinate on data that's not your own. So that's when re this rag comes in. So a little quick review is rack, and then we still have this user providing the input, but instead of sending to large language model directly, we're going to do an extra retrieval step. So when we retrieve from my database, I have my own database, and I maybe put it in the vector database, and then this is my database, and what's important is that this is your data, not the internet data, your data. And then you, maybe you run the store, grocery store, and there are a bunch of different stuff, and then the things that could be in bags, will be Apple, Apple can be put in bags. So in my store, Apple, I was put in back and then will be uh, retrieve the relevant information from here, adding the context and $6 per bag. And then I would like to, and then I would like to provide some instruction. So, well, you're gonna answer this question, how much to bags, but also be kind of brief. Don't be too verbose, don't say too much. And then after you have that, and you will send this to the language model, and then this is a whole thing. My query and context and also the instruction all together is this where augmentation occur and then go back to you and the compound to answer in this case, and then based on this six dollar per bag, large language model perform logic and some math, and the answer is twelve. And it's being very brief, doesn't say anything else, just like twelve dollars. Okay. So that's rack. And going from rag to agent, now I have worked out what uh, as a review how the rag is. I would like to put this to, to show you the contract between rag and agent. How do we go from rag to agent on the left is the rag, and then we actually put instruction here. And instead of thinking in terms of instruction, from the agent, you're trying to make it more like a human. So, and then you will talk about, well, maybe as a rule, instead of saying just instruction, you could think about rewriting the instruction as a role and then it, it could have implication and, and the language model is being shown that if you just say, uh, use the role and they could engage some other part of the skill and knowledge and do much better job. 
So in this case, instead of to be brief, I want to say precisely, I want my model to work as an eager seller. And so the rule, kind of like when I work with my, my son and I, he has messy room, I could give him a lot of instructions saying, oh, you pick up the socks, pick up that dirty laundry. That would be more like rack. But if I see him as a human, I would say, you want to be a clean and organized person. So focus on the rule. And then maybe he is smart enough to know that being a clean, organized person, he needs to pick up his dirty sock. So this is the idea, turning from just instruction to an agent, going from and, and with roles and backstory. So in this case, another thing is that in the retrieval augmented generation setup, and so every time we query, we just send it to the database. But in this case, I like the model, I mean, large language model to actually make decision for us. Maybe you don't always have to look up the, the price right away. So this is one of the possible action you can do. Another possible action is that since you're an eager seller, maybe you want to find opportunity to upsell your product. So upsell is another opportunity action you can potentially perform. So in this case, when the user provides the input, and instead of going to the VR database right away, you actually put the whole thing again, this whole thing is a whole prompt. Role, in this case, no context yet with query and with two possible actions to choose from. In this case, large language model decided, given all this information, Maybe the exchange that well, I do need to look up price. So with that, so I'll go back to really query the database and look up price and same information. I can get the same information, but instead of pre foregoing into the process, we have a large rich model decide I want to look at the VR database. And then also being the eager seller as part of the information provided to the large rich model, it will say, well, Apple has opportunity to upsell, upsell opportunity possible, and maybe 10% uh, off or something. Some extra information that you could get from your VR database that tied to your businesses. In this case, and then after that, and this whole thing one more time again, this whole thing again, sent to a large rich model. In this case, now has some extra context. It still knows it's an eager seller, and you have two items to choose from. Now that it, it knows information, you no longer need to look up price. In this case, large language model will say, well, maybe my next action is upsell. When you upsell, and then also the upsell is that to go back to the user saying that, how about you want to get two bags, but I'm offering three for 15 bucks. How, how about that? So it's $3 is like, it worked out to be about 10, 15% off, I think. So six, instead of buying, paying $12 for two bags, this agent is able to be, act more like an eager seller and to actually offer not just a straight answer about two bags, but like three for $15. Do you want to take it or not? So this is, a, this is trying to show you the contract between rack and agent. And going from one agent, now I want to show you how to then go from one agent to multiple agent and with a a slightly different scenarios. And now we have to go from one agent to two agent. What is, and the, again, the process is that, well, now we have not, we are, this pre-launch, we're trying to develop in this. And then when we're developing this, I want to define this, my two agents. And in this case, going back, I was just focused on very uh, simple, simple business case, like providing some refund. I have a, uh, I would like to provide services to refund, to handle the refund request from the customers. So I'll look at what I have. So I do have some database I already have. So these are my customer databases. This, I guess my CRM. So it knows a lot of my customers. Also have my older, my older system. So these are what I already have before I introduce AI. And now I'm introducing AI. I say, oh, in order to, oh, to, to to offer a refund, what do I each, each usually have? So I usually like to have the first person to answer the phone. So I want to have a helpful. First row is I want to have a helpful receptionist to pick up phone. And then also I don't but I don't want the receptionist to decide on the refund. I, I would like to give the work to a, a generous manager. So for some reason this is suspicious. I have a generous manager. 
And then, then I was thinking about what kind of action or functions or tools that are available for the agent. So for the receptionist agent, so one of the tool is that maybe you can look at who, who is this calling from customer database. And then if you can handle, you think the manager should handle this, you have a transfer function. I transfer to manager. So this is my two function. And for manager, that could decide out, oh, maybe I want to refund. Or maybe I want to reply to the customer. And so that two tool, two action is available. And then can pick what large model you want to use. Is open AI or it could be a cloud and this or llama, so the decision you make about which large model. So all this happening at the design development time, we have not put this online yet. So context is kind of dynamic, it's not decided yet, it's wrong time stuff. And this blue thing is the user input is also leave it open. Now uh so now we finished designing, developing, hopefully, and we'll put it online. So that's what we have. Now we're putting it online, we have actual user. Then I want to work through the uh, actual uh, example case, how, what, how this is gonna happen. So say we have a user actually calling in. When I call in, it goes into the user input. And what we get is that we have a phone number from this user. Also, and the user say, hey, can I speak to the manager? What the user says, speak to manager. So this is a user input we have and in this case uh if we just we could pass then we can now we have enough stuff to pass to our logic model because it has a logic to try and act play the brain of this agent who is a helpful receptionist and how does the logic model know it has to be an agent a helpful receptionist because you pass this whole thing to the logic model so he knows that it has to play a role of a helpful receptionist it has received user input, phone number, speak to the manager, and you have two options you can do, two actions you can do, transfer the manager or who. So initially it decided, well, maybe I don't have to transfer the manager right away and wouldn't be too helpful. So I want to look at who the manager is, who this person is. So I use this tool and this tool is going to engage, then engage my customer databases and look up, well, Turns out this is an important person, it's a VIP, very important person, and his name is Tom, okay? So knowing that, now second round, you still pass this whole thing to large model. Now large model has a slightly more information knowing that it, it talk about a VIP and his Tom, the very important person. So in this case, maybe I do need to transfer to manager. So when I then I will transfer the manager, and then and when that happened, and I will, pass it to this agent. The control is passed to another agent who is a generous manager. And generous manager would, before that we do that, in fact that I want to pass this information over to the generous managers who have the same context and also use the input to work with. So in this case, I can use the pop, we can use this function to, I will select this. Come on, don't do this. So delay this. My sketch, copy and paste, and I'll be able to move. And I move I'll move over here, copy over here. So I have VIP and Tom. I can do the same thing, but I just save myself time. Now the manager has all the information, is going to use his brain, which is larger model, send all this information. It was this, okay, VIP is calling, and I'm generous manager. I have three found reply option it would be odd that i just reply right away maybe i should refund because it's vip it's tom so they will decide well i need to refund so when i refund it and then it will go to our older database not this color older database this time and all the bad is going to return something being okay well, i'm returning you to 120 dollars that's the product you bought last time and with this case and then we send it to a logical model and he says, oh, well, I have everything I need. It's refunded, $1,200. Uh, $1, I think we are ready to reply to our customers. And then they will complete this transaction with the user, with the multi-agent system. So there's a few things that like, you see is happening. That we have this process of transferring from one engine to engine, another agent. Also a communication mechanism of passing data context user input through from one agent to the other agent. So we're gonna take some time later today uh, to, to talk about, to break down those process and communication mechanism and more.
But then I would like to talk about an uh, actual way to implement it. And just a, a, about a week ago, and uh, OpenAI released Swarm, public announced it. So the, the repo is already there that a few months ago. And, and But you can see that this is when they make an announcement. And she was shot up to 15K star. And so, but then uh, a disclaimer about this tool is that it is uh, marketed as a, uh, as the um what is this called educational tool it's not meant for production that you can see the warning message at the top of the github red, red pole and this is true it's actually a very good learning tool i i realized and so and the swarm and the swarm bunch of bunch of bees and each perform very simple stuff and so this is a sample code that you have that they have on their github but now I have i've shown you this template that we've been working with and trying to uh, understand the design process of an agent, a multi-agent system. Now I can do some interesting exercise that could you find a mapping between the implementation or this like hand sketch, high level hand sketch of the agent design. So it turns out quite easy. So you can see that to define an agent here and then you pick the name agent A. So I put agent A here and then you are a helpful agent. So I can write down here, you are a helpful agent. So that's where I write the role, role of this agent. And then we have this function, transfer to agent B, and I'll put it here, transfer to agent B. So that's how I will understand and process this, this example code. I'm going to repeat the same process for the next agent, agent B. So this is my B. And then there's the only speaking haikus. So I will write down the definition. So you are the speak. So speak is, well, speak haiku sounds more like a, a command. So I like to write in the more like a, 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 a agent, a person. So I'll say you are a haiku speaker. So there's a person. Okay, sounds like person. And then you have, you, you don't have any function. So there's no function, no tool. That's it. And very simple. And then we look at the message to the client to actually run this. So you have a user here, a role user. So I can do a user and to start this agent is saying the content, I want to talk to the agent B. So you will, but you will start with agent A. Okay. So the, then that is equivalent to what we see before this user saying to agent A. And what is it? I want to speak this. I want to speak, speak to B. And imagine you send all this to a large language model. What would the large model say you should do? Large model will say, well, let's transfer to B. Okay. So this is how that I could analyze this code using this tool of this graphical uh, hand sketch tool. And it can also work in the opposite way. Suppose you actually design the agent using this template at a high level. And then when you actually, in fact, you want to write the code in Swarm, then you can do the opposite direction. So now you define, I would like to have, a, this is all based on the actual example that I found on the Swarm GitHub repo. So you want to define a user interface agent. So you'll write this into, onto a name field, user interface agent. And then you also could, well, and provide some instruction over here. So that's how you populate it. Of course, in real life example, you write a bit more. And you also have a function that you will just put into this array. Similarly, for next one, OpenAI help center agent. So you will write down into the instruction over here. You are the OpenAI help agent. And then for the function, it's three of this. And then they're all mapped to. Actually, maybe it's not what I do. This is prettier this way. I can map this into an array with into this array. Okay, so you can see the correspondence going back and forth. It's help you sort of like uh, have a high level sketches about designing your uh, agent. So, so Swarm is pretty simple, very simplistic, and it, but help you kind of get a good feel of what the more basic, uh, uh, basic multi-agent system. And when you're ready, you could use a more advanced system such as Crew AI and so when I learned about this, I, I think I learned about crew about like April. Now is we are 
of October and now they have 20k star and they just got uh, 18 million Series A funding that's getting pretty serious. So that's how I thought I could use this as an example to talk about some more, more advanced um, AI agent concept and techniques that beyond the simple swarm. And so let's think about, this is a actual code also from the crude AI. And as you can see, uh, that the, the prompt, this is a prompt you write to define the agent. It's a bit more complicated now. It's still not too complicated because you can still map them using this template. So you will say that they define a row. So for instance, let's go here. So you want to define a researcher, okay? And then you should have row and go and backstory. So there's a prompt. And then on the right-hand side, so I know, well, my Asian one is a researcher, researcher. And then all the row and go and backstory, you can just feed this over to this block. And then when you, and okay. And then, and for the next agent, defining a set of agents, the re, we have reporting analysts. So it's just gonna write an analyst here or another analyst. And then, it has a row and go and backstory. Then I know this going to O, just feed right this in this block. And the next is to figure out what kind of uh, action that I like them to, to, to do. And so, and then we, we read, and then there's a different file they get to write that define the task. In this case, the first task is a research task. And then the agent that run this task is researcher. So I could put this research test over here. So this is one of my tool. And there could be other tests too, but not in this file. I, don't, I didn't show in this file. And another test, a reporting task, who can run do this task is reporting analyst. So with this information, I will continue to develop this. So I will say a uh, write report is on the task. Okay, so this is a uh, task that's trying to separate the definition of this task and tool into the, this separate uh, YAML file. And the nice thing about this is that you could work together with your other team members who may be more on the business side rather than on the coding side. They can work on this definition of the agent together in a less intimidating manner because you don't that because they don't have to see the Python code. But you are going to see some Python code in this just in a second. All right. So this is how in crew AI you define uh, agents and you also define tools or functions that are kind of used interchangeably here or tasks. But now we're going to talk about process, the breakdown of process. So I want to kind of talk about some of the typical process. So when we look at these multi examples, so this process refers to the way that we transfer control from one agent to the other agent like this. And the most basic pattern is the sequential pattern that was uh, in use in Swarm and they can support it by Crowd AI as well. And the idea is we have a start with the agent. If the, you decide that, well, I'm gonna transfer to B, so we're gonna add to B, and then B maybe transfer, decided, oh, now maybe I can look at some information. If then I eventually transfer to C, and then D transfer to D, and then the D could decide I can transfer to A again. So this is going through as a list or a loop sequentially. And each time you have one agent running, but once it's done, it hang off to the other one. So it's sequ sequential. And the, the advantage of this is that, that it's a lot easier for us you to reason and to understand and to describe the process. And then a, a slightly more complicated would be to bring in hierarchy into this, uh, uh, this process and crew AI support this hierarchical process that you would arrange them more like a tree and it, it mirrors a lot of company organization as well. So we have a special agent called manager. And then this manager doesn't perform any specific task other than just tell other people to do so. Right? Tell transfer to delegate to A, delegate to B, delegate to C, have A, B, C, three, three agents. So when delegate to A, A when A is done, come back to manager and then manager can decide, okay, now I want to delegate to C, and now I want to delegate to B. So there's a hierarchical. One person decided who, which agent needs to be engaged. 
And and so they could look at some code, but they but in the open source, I like open source because I can read their code, understand how exactly they might implement the particular function. And so in this case, I found this piece of prompt, system prompt that can tell you that well hierarchical manager agent. So the role is a crew to here. You can see that whoops. Oops, let's erase this. The role is crew manager. So what so what right crew you are the crew manager. And then you will have a go and back story here. And then this O will be insert into this one. But what's interesting is that if you read this more carefully, you'll say, well, your ability to get a take get a Get, uh, delegate work to the right people and to ask the right questions imply that two tasks this perform in the backstory even explicitly mentioned that you could delegate you can also ask the right question so that uh, there's two of these functions so when you read the source code of how a manager are, is created then you will see down here you have a manager object and have a role go and backstory that retrieved from uh I-18, so there's an internationalization effort going on there. And all this will be used to populate this part to the definition, description of this agent, manager agent. And, and then have a, this line, so I get all the agent tool, all the tools, all the, from all the agents. So supposed to have three agents under the manager's management. So we'll have the tool, we'll have A, transfer, delegate to A, delegate B, delegate to C, this is an array here, A, B, C, and also asking question A, asking question B, and asking question C, okay? All right, so there's I, um, so it's kind of like a function call or procedure. So if with A, subroutine, you call subroutine, you don't expect the answer, but you call the, make a question is a function call. You call A, but you expect the answer, except that, because we're talking about multi agent, we don't want to use programming term like function. We tend to use question answering or delegation, the more like human. And so, and then going from hierarchical, they are started, you started to see that, well, they are even come more complex process. It's kind of hard to manage, kind of describe in the hierarchical manner. So you'll introduce what if A wants to transfer to B, and B, you want B to transfer to C, and you want C to transfer back to B, you want B to transfer transfer to A again, and then before, wait, this is terrible H. Before C, okay, C back to B, and B back to A, and before going back to the manager. Okay, so that's like a very arbitrary graph you could define beforehand that work for your business process. You start to see uh, example like graph. So in terms of process, you, go, you can see that the, the most e exist will be the sequential one here, like list and loop or like tree or like a graph, okay? And let's, let's talk about communication. We looked at this example, communication. Where does communication happen is this, this relationship. What are other patterns that, that they can be used or have seen? So one going back to swarm, we have a linear sequential process that one after the other. But when we, when that happened, uh, the uh, one really natural way to communicate between the agent is do a co handoff Basically, is we start with that when we are passing from B, A to B, for instance, I will pass all the context down to the next one. And then this, in this case, maybe I don't have anything, but for B, maybe first we, think, we look at, we, now this action is being triggered. So this question, look at something from a database and get some extra context. And then second round, the context here, and then we we'll pass down to C next. And after pick down C, this get copy over plus. And then let's use different color. In this case, maybe it triggers another database looked up into a different database and to look at something that is a triangle. And when C transfers down to D, you just pass along, keep passing as you accumulate knowledge. So in this case, this get copy over. So what do we get copy over? Right? Get copy over is uh this and this and and then in this case you could continue this process maybe now I look it up running out of color so this and look up from my database and come back to something maybe look on X so this just keep 
passing off every everything you have just pass to the, the next agent and hopefully they'll take it and in this case the song property of this is kind of like a is a stateless so no one has to remember this because it always just pass everything down and the real world analogy is kind of like a, i think is kind of like when uh me my wife and a babysitter trying to all work together to take care of my son when he was really young so then we have this notebook that to keep track of what he has eaten and stuff and then we just pass the notebook down then and everybody remember all i get in the hospital setting they have a chart patient chart every every shift you have a new nurse and the nurse, this nurse will just take the chart that has all the information so it's like a handoff that was implemented in swarm but it's the most basic way of communication between the agents and then in crew ai you start to see the question answering so in the technical term you can think of you a programmer you can think of it as a function call but you but since we're talking about agent we're trying trying to use human term you don't use function code with your manager or your or for myself i don't see my students as someone i just make a function call i do a question answering so in this case when the a can say one was one was ask b and then when asked when b being asked and so this question being added into the input of not wrong direction okay now here input of b and then when b finally get the answer and b will transfer back the answer to a so there's a little function call if c can also ask question of d for instance similarly and when d is ready to return oh then then draw this too so they will return to c as a new input so this is the relationship so i have to come back first so the communication kind of happen in that question answering and responses question you ask another and then you get an answer back you're guaranteed to get an answer back and so um so the uh, advantage of this is that function call is very easier for people people are familiar with making function call especially you're a developer also people are familiar with asking questions and getting answers emailing a question to your uh your colleague expecting an answer back so it's very easy to reason and then lastly was the messages that you will potentially put something in and other people will be listening as well so there's another another uh system that i've been seeing for instance i put this in and somehow b is listening to this listen and then when the messages sees that and b is engaged so there's a way transferring messages you, you have a share messages queue so that's also quite common in the uh, supported by crew ai and some other multi-agent framework all right and then i kind of talk about a memory system another interesting concept is memory system so suppose we have this ex exchange that uh that we're process refund and coming back in 15 bucks and so and then instead of having explicit communication between the between agents sometimes you could build put the memory use a separate uh, database to store memories so for instance you can exchange a process refund in 15 dollar back this thing is a bit more like just immediate transaction so we put it we tend to put a short-term memory as is in the raw text maybe embedded in the text embedding so because of that typically we use a big database to store the short-term memory but then in the long-term memory you, if a agent you would like the agent to continue to evolve and become better so you could take this in in the entire intersection and say oh, well maybe we should evaluate this process reflect upon this is this anywhere i can improve and you can ask the large, large model is pretty smart with logic to analyze this and telling that well i'll give you a quality score of say seven and i suggest that just instead of saying just 15 dollars back why don't you be more polite next time so this is the something that the legends learning where do you put this learning put in the long-term memory and there's a bit more larger and so you can put a, a sql structure because quality and suggestions kind of like a, in good in the table and then when you when next time agent b or agent a agent b is agent a b engaged they will be able to draw from both the short-term memory and also a long-term memory to use them 
and adding that to the context. So next time. So that how the agent can evolve, improve. So using this memory system. And you can see the implementation again that this is happening. So in the short-term memory implementation of crew AI, and you will see that that when you just when it, you just basically save the output and also the description, which is what we have here, you save this into a short-term memory. And then if we looked at the implementation of the long-term memory, you can see something similar okay, here. Okay, so we have this long-term memory item, but let me see. I mean, so, and then you can see that you use the LM agent here to evaluate, run evaluate, and then with text and output, task and output. And then as a result, then you store them, save them into, so what do you get? You get suggestion and quality, which is why we have yeah, suggestion quality. And then you save them into your long-term memory, save them in the long-term memory. So you can see that code actually implement this logic that it was a long-term memory that there, because you like to, you like your agent, multi-agent, to learn from the system and become better on its own too. Okay, and so now I'm going to talk about a few more even uh, advanced example to apply some of the knowledge you have learned, I've talked about. So first I'm gonna talk about open hands. So you might heard of uh, Devon, which is from cognitive and cognition AI. And like was, what at the time was like, they making a claim is the first software engineer based entirely on AI. And so in some the group decided to open sources, so open Devon and become really popular. And it is rebranded into open hands. And you can see that this is about this when it, that's when open Dave, uh, Devon happens and then over time then it becomes open hands. And so this is a legitimate system that lots of people use them and they're trying to become a soft, trying to act as a software engineer, as a group of software engineers that handle different things. So there's a user interface, have a chat on the part, on the side chat, and then you can see that all the action trying to do, and some view of the code that's being edited and can, it can also search the web, and then also pro produce some kind of report. So there's a whole trying to, trying to model the entire software engineering process with multi-agent system. And because open source, again, you can see the code and this is a system architecture diagram that generously posted in the GitHub repo. And I have to say, it's pretty complicated and it's pretty scary to look at it. And would you have like studied it? But then if you were just focus on this key concept that I was just going through, ask you that you, well, any agent system will have to define a bunch of agents, multi-agent system define a bunch of agents. And you look at this diagram, it must be somewhere that defining a bunch of agents. So it turns out it's over here, this agent block. So you learn from, oh, there's a whole bunch of agents here. And you can look at the code and look, read their system plan and learn from it. And every agency has a process. In this process, you can see that, oh, well, is this linear? Is this hierarchical? Turns out I have a controller, has a manager. So you learn that, oh, we have a manager. It's a hierarchical sort of process. And you have a communication mechanism. Is this a uh, handoff? Is this based on the messages or based on? So it turns out you look at the event stream. So you know, is this based on messages? Also not based on question answering. And you have a memory system. Does the way you use the memory system? So if a storage here, here. So there must be a memory system. If a S3 is a local in memory. So it can kind of guess that this must be some kind of shorter memory. This is a long-term memory because of more like file storage. And then you can see how this, all this being added to an original LLM only scenario and to give you a multi-agent system. So you can, and this L large length model here, so have their commercial model or their own open source models there. And you can pr practice this again with another one, colder, another uh, pretty uh, like a state-of-the-art system for resolving GitHub issue. So now you look at agent, you know the file of this, and then the process is, and it turns out, if you look at the process here, if a task graph, the well, is a graph system, and communication, how is communication done? Is a handoff, it is question answering, it turns out it's, it's a kind of new way of seeing, 
doing is writing report. So it's similar, almost like Q&A because the manager assigns something and they all write report back. And then let's do you, does it have a memory? So it turns out I can't really find explicitly when they talk about they have short-term memory and long-term memory. So maybe they don't evolve over time. So that's missing. And they have a larger model, which is implied. It doesn't really show this in the graph. And then, so, and even it worked out for a multi-agent model that this is a exercise for you. And then based on why, how, dot AI, they have multiple graphs. They're trying to say having one large um, knowledge graph is not as good as having multiple smaller specialized knowledge graph, especially for legal. They can build from the, this document from this into this tree. And once if it's tree, you could have a multiple agents here. So just work on agents. So have this, this user query, but you have this agent, definition agent, search agent, supervisor agent, router agent, retrieval agent, insert agent. So this is a multi-agent system. As a process, the process it, it, to me looks like obviously it's a graph system kind of going this. It's not doesn't follow a strict tree architecture or linear architecture. And communication is, uh, you could analyze how do they communicate. So it turns out they probably communicate through passing this graph. So here is passing this graph, subgraph as communication. And the memory is, is just stored in this graph database themselves and building upon large language model. Okay, so let's very quickly going through how apply the, how this, if you understand some basic concept, process communication, memory, logic model agents, that's another concept too. But then if you apply the same set of concept that help you going through multiple use cases and analyze the multiple framework, then how you can achieve and solve this, solve the particular business problem, model your existing business process that help you succeed. All right, so at the end, uh, remember you could download my uh, slide, the same website. So because single store usually put the recording on YouTube. So I'll also share a link on that once the YouTube video is up. Question. Sorry, didn't leave much time. But uh, we have a multi-agent system going on. Akmal like has been answering a lot of questions in the background. So it's <laughs> neither sequential nor hierarchical. It's a parallel. So it's one pattern I did not talk about today. Um, Tom, there was a question about the slides, uh, 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 and forgive me. Uh, I mean, I downloaded the PDF version of your slides. I looked through them. For me, to me, they look okay, but I think people were expecting animation in there. Was that the case or not? Oh, animation will be in the recording. That is a practice slide. They could follow my. Yes, animation. that's what I thought. Yeah, that's right. So essentially, eventually, we, the once we upload, providing... yeah. So once yeah. I uploaded the video, then that would be you would be able to use slides and the and the video at the same time. Okay, great, thank you. And I think the there was a um, uh, let me just check. I think it was uh, see who was asking. Uh, Josephine. Josephine was asking for real world examples. So I think you mentioned Swarm, for example, and Crew AI. So the I think in the case of Swarm, uh, I think you referenced the GitHub repo. I mean, the nice thing about OpenAI is that they do release these technologies uh, for, on GitHub, and you can go and have a look at them. I've used Clip, for example, and I've used Whisper from GitHub. Awesome. You know, they're free. They're easy to work with. But uh, I think the question was really, uh, do you have some examples of real-world uh, you know, uses of these? Uh, so today I share a few real world example and open hand is probably the most complex one and they have entire open source repository. You can just look, check each file and learn from the way they write prompts and how they coordinate and stuff. And so this is a, a bit more application because it has an actual application of fixing writing software and fixing addressing search in the web. And crew AI is more of a framework and it doesn't, it could be applied to a real world example. Some, maybe some other repository have used crew AI. So when you study crew AI, it helps you understand the framework. How does a general framework support many, many, many different use cases of crew AI? And so there's a two different directions you can you could study and to, uh, and to see whether they can apply to your particular use case. And Swarm is again educational. You only support handoff and also sequential process and handoff for communication. But then it but because it's also small enough a lot easier for you to swallow and understand and process to help you build foundation. So I also encourage you to check Swarm to build the technical foundation before you extend your uh, multi-agent skill to using a 
more advanced framework. Yeah, there's a great question here from uh, Kiran. Uh, asks, what if the agent encounters failures? Uh, so it says it looks like covered mostly the positive scenarios. I assume uh, there is error handling, escalations, etc. cetera. Uh, uh, yes, of course. Uh, but uh, did you have some thoughts on that, Tom? Um, any, any ideas about how... how the um, so, so in Swarm, Korea, I both have a, a section that talk about how they provide some evaluation. So they could provide some test cases. For instance, each of this task and description. And there's another field called expected outcome. And so they could be used to test it. And if you don't pass those expected outcome, the model itself is smart enough to su make suggestions as well. That's where the memory mm -hmm. comes in. They could, they was able to learn to fix it and then go back to your long term, go into the long term memory and maybe some, then will be something more like extra, extra prompt get added automatically. For instance, be polite, be more precise, cite the references and, yeah. and ask user for clarification. Those could be added in part of your uh, long term memory build out process. But again, there's so another aspect you not talk about is the cost because you can see that this whole thing needs to be fed into your large language model. You better have lots of open AI API credits or you run your own model <laughs> to to the multi agent can be expensive too yeah. to run. Great. Thank you very much for that, Tom. Uh, you see, I'll hand back to you because uh, we are at the top of the hour and I guess half past where you are in India. So uh, probably uh, time yeah. to, uh, to wrap up. All right. So thanks everyone for joining. And if you have any other questions, feel free to reach out to us at team at singlestore.com or you can also reach out to me or Akmal uh, via LinkedIn. Then we'll try to take care of whatever questions you have. Also, if you have any feedback, any ideas on topics that you would like to see in future sessions, please feel free to, uh, you know, just let us know and uh, we'll try our best to cater to that. And if you're interested in the future sessions, I have put it in the chat. Uh, you can attend. Uh, we are on October 28th. We are presenting Build with Node.js on Single Store. And on October 29th, we are uh, presenting Building a Full Stack Next JS AI app. And tomorrow we are actually presenting a joint webinar with Hasura and that uh, webinar caters to agents. So if you like today's topic, feel free to tune in tomorrow and really appreciate everyone joining here. Have a great rest of the day. Thanks Tom for joining. And we really appreciate that you did, took out the time to do this webinar with us and we're hoping to do more in future. All right. Take care everyone. Thank you.